countdown to the last comic shop in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey, hey, it's now time for that place called the last comic shop. That's right, we are opening up the shop to newbies to help them find their way underneath this giant comic book tent. And we're keeping the lights on for the oldies, who as one of my comic co-hosts here had asked, are there any good Batman titles that are in continuity that someone could just pick up and read? Well, we have that answer for you today. Yes, because we've got another DC book coming at you. I'm the host with the most, Andy Larson, and joined by Jay Scott and Chad Smith, of course, as always. And as, as I mentioned, like, you, you think that we would get a, a DC book on this show that wasn't involving Superman or Batman. No, no, that's all we do here when we do talk about <laughs> In our defense, that's all DC makes. That is true. But also, I mean, Batman's in one panel, and Superman shows up for like three panels or four panels. But they're still in this book, and we're talking about Robin. Like, this is the original Robin. This is Dick Grayson in today's review of first six issues of Tom Taylor's run on Nightwing. Plus an additional issue that comes after this fear state or whatever, which we just wanted to talk about because it's the one with all the continuing panel. But anyways, um, you can get in a trade now, volume one, which is called Leaping Into the Light. That's right. You do not get issue 87, which is the one continuous panel, but you do get the first six, which is uh, 78 through 83. So if you're interested and you're at a local comic book shop, you can get it in trade, which a lot of folks like to do with their comic books nowadays. So, but it is, again, a Batman-related book. <laughs> I'm trying to think if we covered any other DC books on, on this show that didn't involve either Batman or Superman. The only one I can think of is Rorschach, which I guess doesn't count because that's Watchmen, and that's their other big property. We did uh, V for Vendetta. Okay. Wonder Woman, but Superman and Batman were there, at least in skeletal form. <laughs> That's right. No, I don't think they showed up in the other history of the DC Universe. Yeah, they did. The Outsiders hated Batman. That's right. Oh, right. Yes. And they talked about uh, Superman being like he was all packaged nicely, even though he was a foreigner, too. Yeah, there isn't a book out there that doesn't involve either Batman, Superman, or something Alan Moore's written. Because we did do... Uh, 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 New Gods. New Gods is related to Superman now because Darkseid's one of his rogues gallery members. Ha! Yeah, yeah but and no, but... but no. Darkseid made his first appearance in Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. Sorry, I, I got you on that one. New Gods. I was they weren't say, in that. Strange Adventures has Batman in it for a panel, right? Oh, Oh, yeah, that's Batman's the guy who gets Mr. Terrific. Right. And I think Superman shows up in another panel when, like, Adam Strange is going and going, like, Hey, you guys, can you uh, help me out here with this problem? Get this guy off my back and stuff. I'm, I'm a, I'm a jla And so, yeah. I guess we, I guess that's the challenge for us this year is to find a book that's, again, not Batman or Superman related or written by Alan Moore that deals with DC Comics. J.A. keeps on talking about doing more Green Lantern on this show and then wussing out at the last second. No, I don't want to read that. Yeah. <laughs> so, but one thing that J.A. doesn't wuss out on every single week is giving us a weekly poll, which we love to do out on our Twitter page, at Last Comic Shop. So we, we like to come on these programs and do these poll recaps because evidently if you're going to vote on something, you like to hear the results? Question mark? I don't know. Do you? We never hear any feedback one way or the other. So we're going to continue to do them until you tell us that you don't like this anymore. Uh, but Jay's got five polls for us on this week's show, starting off with the poll that happened, I think, around our huge event of the summer, the Last Chicken Shop Challenge. That's right. Yes, this this poll comes with its own logo, which we maybe we put on a T-shirt at some point. We've got a Last Chicken Shop logo. This is the best chicken the final four uh, was Jolly Bee, Buffalo Wild Wings, Popeyes, and Royal Farms. We put it to a vote, and Popeyes cleaned the house. <laughs> it, it wasn't, wasn't close. even close. Yeah, over fifty percent. The Popeyes, Royal Farms, squeaking in at nine percent. I almost felt bad for them, except that I've had Royal Farms, and so I didn't feel bad for them. 
I feel bad from Royal Farms. You got the word wrong. <laughs> uh, Jolly Bee, a, a moderate second place, was pretty good for a uh, a chicken that's hard to find in the United States at the moment. And Buffalo Wild Wings, pretty distant third. I, I do enjoy Popeyes. I tell, I said it on the show. They have a, a chicken sandwich that rivals Chick Fil A in terms of tastiness, especially if you get their spicy chicken sandwich. I love Popeyes and the sides, right, Chad? The sides. Oh, that red beans and rice. Mwah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what was the next poll, Ja? Outside of four, who is your favorite person who is able to wield Milton? Was it Better Ray Bill? Jane Foster, Steve Rogers, or Eric Masterson. There, a couple other people have obviously weld Mjolnir in the past. Did you say weld Mjolnir? <laughs> like they're attaching things with that thing from the shop <laughs> You know who my wheel. favorite person to wield Mjolnir was, and it wasn't on the list, but it's like a technicality, is the Hulk. Because he didn't exactly wield Mjolnir, he wielded Thor. There was an issue where Close Thor was up. knocked unconscious. He like, picks yeah. up Thor and uses him to hit people with the hammer. <laughs> it was the best. But I, I was surprised with this. Here I was thinking Better Ray Bill was going to run away with this poll. And well, I think Better Ray Bill would have run away with it had Endgame not come out and have that Steve Rogers moment. Everyone loved that moment. It was arguably the best beat in the entire movie, and it's translated to the voting world because everyone went with that beat. Yeah, Steve Rogers ran away with this, which, by the way, last week on on last week's show, if you were listening to some of our interviews from a, a recent Comic-Con uh, we were talking with Brett Breeding, like he was the one that threw out the idea for Steve Rogers to pick up the hammer. And and everybody loved it. And so there you go. You learned some stuff on The Last Comic Shop if you listen to some of our awesome episodes. I, I will say, though, that Better Ray Bill, for not showing up in any MCU, he got 38% to Steve Rogers' 44. So he did quite well. I mean, that is a deep cut, right? Better Ray Bill at this moment, unless you read the comics, probably don't know who he is. He yeah. got 38% of the vote, so you right. know, that's pretty good. But no, Steve Rogers ran away with it. And I mean, again, it is the most iconic. It I, is Again, I don't think 44 to 38 is running away with it. He just won handsomely. He didn't run away with it. All right. Well, I think J.A. is still bitter with the fact that, like, now after he read Jane Foster's Thor, he's kind of P.O.'d that he didn't turn into Thor. Like, he picked up the hammer. He should have became, like, massive and all blonde-haired. Yeah, and Captain method. America should have turned into Thor. He shouldn't look like Captain America. Like, he should just turn into Thor. He picked up the hammer. Like, that's what yeah. happens. Well, yeah. hold on, wait. So I think Thor, I think I'm turning into, like, like a rock god. But then when I think Captain America, what would the Captain America rock god look like? Is that like Kid Rock? Does Captain I guess. America get a mullet with the hammer and a dirty mustache? He'd have there like this ball, giant ball, ball, bald eagle ball. on his chest. Yeah. <laughs> Chad, how excited are you for that new upcoming Better Ray Bill action figure? The mohawk helmet and stuff like that. I'm excited. I no, I, I didn't know they were. I didn't know it was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is a thing. Hey, you're supposed to be my action figure guy. I, Listen, I got my action figure, my four-inch Marvel Universe Beta Ray built ten years ago. That's I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> mm. All right, let's move on to our next poll. What was our next poll, Jay? Our next poll, uh, the entire poll was a deep cut, uh, save for one. Favorite weapon of Thor's besides Yona. So is it Thunderstrike? Lightbringer? Frog Yolner, which is the hammer of Throg, the Frog of Thunder, or Stormbreaker, which is actually Better A Bill's weapon. Yes, yeah. In the in the comic, I, I'll, I'll point out that in the comic, Stormbreaker is Better A Bill's. Stormbreaker won with forty one percent, but Frog Yolner, a impressive thirty six percent. So. Uh, you know, in your previous week's poll about who was the best person to wield Molnir, like everybody came out of the woodwork to be like, where's Frog Thor on this? Throg. So, like, where's Throg? All right. Well, it's still, like people were kind of PO'd. So I, I think that that kind of equated to being like, we're going to yes. vote for him in something. <laughs> well, you know what I think? I think this means that we need to cover a Throg book at some point. <laughs> Is there a Throg book? Maybe it's yeah. an issue. Dad's salivating over there. It's an opportunity for us to cover 
for by Walt Simonson. He's all, but that was why I didn't vote for that. I thought it was the same hammer because originally, you know, four turns into the frog and he just has frog sized of, of Mjolnir. I thought it was the same weapon. Am I, am I wrong with that? I think it was originally Mjolnir. It's an interesting okay. debate here on the last comic shop as to whether or not that was the same hammer. Ah, uh, uh, here, here, I've got it from the Marvel database. Ready? Yeah. So Frog Yolner is a sliver of Mjolnir, which transformed into a miniature version of Mjolnir and granted Simon Walterson the power of Thor. So it is technically different. Okay. It's, yes. I, I mean, Wait, it, it broke off when Toothnasher tapped it with his <laughs> I, the more I read, the more I love. Oh, man. There's a whole extra origin here I'm finding about how Simon Walters was a college football star who was cursed by a witch and turned into a frog. Oh, we're reading this. We're reading this. <laughs> All right. Well, what, we're also going to read the next uh, the next poll. So what's the next poll from this? Uh, uh, this one was a bit of a deep. Uh, I, we had some deep cut polls this, uh, this last run through. So this was the best detective film noir, not best film noir, best detective film noir. So it's noir, baby, noir. Yeah. So like things like Sunset Boulevard, that wasn't up for this. Um, Double Indemnity, arguably the greatest and best film noir not up for this. I can't believe that that guy's the same dad as, as in, I think, what, My Three Sons? Key, Key Largo, one of my favorites. Key Largo's great. Uh, we had The Maltese Falcon, Touch of Evil, Laura, and Out of the Past. Now, uh, there had been some comment why I wasn't Chinatown in. I put Laura in because I was hoping to educate. Everyone should see Laura. It's you know, Jean Tierney at her best. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that one. So I think we all kind of sort of know which one here. It's the it, one. It, 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 everyone, everyone knows Maltese Falcon, so it won. But I'm saying don't sleep on Robert Mitchum because Robert Mitchum will out noir any noir. Oh, see here. I was thinking that you would say don't sleep on a better movie than Maltese Falcon, which is The Big Sleep. Yeah, but which which version do you want? Do you want the, the Robert Mitchum Big Sleep, or you can have the Humphrey Bogart Big Sleep? You want the Humphrey Bogart one, because it's got Bogart and Bacall in their first movie together. It has this great scene, which is like, by far one of the sexiest scenes in movies that you don't actually see any sex. <laughs> Humphrey Bogart goes into a bookstore, there's this woman with glasses who's obviously into him, and she's like, hey, what are you doing here? And he's like, oh, I'm just watching this building across the street. And she takes off the glasses, <laughs> pulls out a bottle of, like, booze, and then it fades to black. And the next thing you know, he's like, hey, watch that building. <laughs> <laughs> they just did it in the bookstore, and they just didn't show it. That's what the back office is for in a bookstore, apparently, <laughs> in the 40s. Can you still see? Can you still see the building from the back office? I don't know. <laughs> it's a great movie. Watch The Big Sleep, but also watch The Maltese Falcon. Also watch Laura. Also watch uh, Touch of Evil. Uh, that's got one of the best beginnings in all cinema with Orson Welles shot down the street. This isn't a movie podcast, but we're going to gush about movies for a few seconds. And then, yeah, watch uh, Out of the Past. Out of the Past. Because it's got Robert, Robert Mitchum. Mitchum at his best. Yeah. And what was the fifth poll recap of this show, J.A.? Well, this comes on the backs of uh, Comic-Con. Which Marvel MCU Phase 6 movie are you most looking forward to? Phase 6, not ah. Phase 5. Phase 6. So it's okay. is it Fantastic Four with the numeral 4, Avengers, the Kong Dynasty, or Avengers Secret Wars? Oh, yeah. In my heart of hearts, I know what I picked, but I'm not going to say. What did everybody else say, Jay? What was the ultimate winner here? Well, the ultimate winner and the pick I went with as well was Fantastic Numeral Four. Oh. Did you hear that it's not going to be an origin story? Everybody knows that, so they're just going to jump right into the Fantastic Four and not tell you. you know. And, I, and I, I think that's the right call. Because if you've ever watched any of the Fantastic Four cartoon shows, they can tell you the origin in about three seconds. They 
get shot up in a rocket. They all turn into monsters. The best is the Norm Macdonald bit about their origin. <laughs> Mr. Fantastic is giving everybody their names. And he's like, well, Ben, you've you've been turned into some kind of kind of monster. We'll we'll call you the thing. And Johnny, you're a you're a, a human torch. And Sue, you turn invisible. So you'll be the invisible woman. And me, I can stretch. So I'll be Mr. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I voted for I think which was the runner up in this particular poll, which was uh, a- a- Avengers uh, Secret Wars. That's I mean I'm I'm hoping that it's more akin to what happened with uh, Hickman and like Battle World and Smashing Universes and stuff as opposed to the first Secret Wars. Although that's great, it, it was just like they got scooped up and thrown somewhere. Like I don't know, it doesn't have the Gravitas of all the universes colliding and little bits of those universes coming together. But it had together. better toys. <laughs> it did have better toys. It did. And do you really want to go through all the different battle worlds? I do! I want the weird worlds and I want them like trekking through and upside down stuff. I want there to be like the Planet Hulk world. I want there to be the Thors as cops. It'll be great. What do you vote for, Chad? I want Secret Wars as well. Uh, Although I'm leaning more towards the 1984 Secret Wars, where it's just banging the toys together. Okay. That's my jam. All I hope is that they get uh, the true Spider-Man black costume. Ah. In. Not 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 the, the cinema black costume, where it's just they took a Spider-Man suit and they spray painted it black. I want the, the comic original. I mean, I, I never liked that in Spider-Man 3 where you could see the lines on the costume. I was like, no, well, no, no, no. no. I, it, it, you need the white. You need the white spider yeah. with the legs that come to the sides and connect to the back. And, and it's all looking like sleek. There's no lines anywhere. It just looks like. No shadow. Exactly. It's like light is absorbed into that suit. Like it, there's nothing. And, and all you see is the eyes peering out of the darkness. That's what I'm hoping for. But yeah, we'll have to see. Nobody voted for Kang Dynasty. Shrugs. Because everyone saw him in uh, that Loki show, and they're like, really? That's going to be the next big bad? No, no. Where's Ghost Doctor Doom? (laughs) And make sure that you check us out uh, every single week at The Last Comic Shop for wonderful polls from J.A. Scott at Last Comic Shop on Twitter. And make sure that you stick around after these commercial breaks for another Batman-related repile. We can't get enough of those guys. It is Nightwing by Tom Taylor. Stay tuned. Greetings, henchmen and loyal subjects. I am Evan the Great. And I'm JVD. We're your host of the Fictional Battle Podcast, Crossover Collision, brought to you by the Villains Demand. If you love hearing in-depth breakdowns of your favorite characters and what they are capable of doing while fighting in random battlegrounds against other fan favorites, then this is the podcast for you. New episodes drop every Friday wherever you listen to your favorite podcast or over on thebuildsman.com. Dragon Ball Z, One Piece, Naruto, all things that we love, all manga that were originally published in the legendary magazine Weekly Shonen Jump. But not every series can run for 300 chapters and have a hit anime. This is David. This is Jordan. We're the hosts of Shonen Flop. Each episode, we look at manga that ran and jumped that didn't quite make it. We discuss what it did wrong, what it did right, how the series could have turned itself around, and ultimately, was it a flop or not? Run all your favorite podcast apps, and you can find us at shonenflop.com. Keep on flopping, floppers. All right, we're back with more of The Last Comic Shop, and it is now time for our Read Pile Review. Yes, that time of every single show where I say, Read Pile Review, very fast. And sometimes our reviews aren't fast. They actually last about 20 minutes. And we, if we're talking about a DC book, we're talking about either the Man of Steel or the Cape Crusader or one of the members of their supporting cast. Because evidently, that's what DC knows sells comics. So if you want books other than ones that star Superman or Batman, here's me getting on my little bit of a soapbox. Go buy other books. That's what happens. You go out to local comic book shops. You pick up other series with other superheroes. If you want those books to be published, it's as simple as that. But in any case, we're talking about Nightwing on today's program and the first six issues, which you can now get in a trade. And uh, Chad, who wrote and drew these particular six issues of Nightwing? 
Okay, so Nightwing, we are going to cover Volume 1, Leaping into the Light, which covers issues 78 to 83. And then we've also decided to tack on, just for funsies, the Eisner-nominated issue 87, which is the one continuous panel issue. But they are all written by Tom Taylor. They have art by Bruno Redondo. Uh, Adriano Lucas does colors. Wes Abbott does letters. Bruno Redondo does the great covers for each of these issues. And, uh, yeah, J.A., do you want to give us the rundown on what is this story all about? Nightwing is in, now are we, are we calling it Bloodhaven or Bloodhaven? Because it's spelled with, with an umlaut, so I like Bloodhaven, but I think probably everyone says Bloodhaven. Anyways, he's in Bloodhaven, and he's just come into a lot of money, a lot of money, uh, willed to him by Alfred Pennyworth. I'm talking billions of dollars. And so he's deciding what he's going to do with that. Bloodhaven is just overrun with criminals. It's it's run by Blockbuster, who looks exactly like Triple H for some reason. Did he always look like Triple H with the ponytail? Or is that <laughs> is that a new thing? I'm wondering. Anyways, there's this guy running around stealing hearts from homeless men, and that story kind of percolates for a bit and goes away and never gets resolved. And there's a mayor that might be related to Nightwing, and that kind of goes away a bit and doesn't get resolved. Should have been ten issues, and maybe we just didn't read it all. But it's interesting, and at the end of it, Nightwing's got a lot of money and is trying to do Bloodhaven, what Bruce Wayne did to Gotham, and clean it up. And, and there's a dog with three legs. Yeah! Uh, who's adorable. And Babs is in this series all the time. Barbara Gordon! You get a little bit more of their romance, which it's always interesting to ask people who's uh, Dick Grayson's, you know, uh, OTP, one one true pairing. And uh, for me, it's always Babs. Like some people say Starfire. Some people say uh, I- I'm always with Babs. They're co-workers, they're lovers. They're they're everything. They're a great couple. So who do you think is Dick Grayson's one true pairing, guys? Real quickly, Chad. Uh, I've always been a Batgirl fan. Uh, especially dating back to the days when, when the missus, before she was the missus, dressed up as Batgirl and I dressed up as Burwood Robin, and we won the costume contest at that bar in Baltimore. Nice! So, J.A.? Uh, I guess Batgirl, if not Batman himself, as the one true <laughs> pairing. I don't know. What I loved about this book is that all the Bat universe, they're all like on a group chat. <laughs> How yeah, cool that is that? That was like what that was a nice little call out. I was going to get into it later when we got into the book, but I like the fact that they all talk to each other and basically make fun of every well, make fun of Dick Grayson. He, yeah. he seems to be like the, well, the one who can't get as ahead. As we get to Dick Grayson's the heart of any single book. So like the fact that he's there to kind of be the older brother, they all make fun of him, but at the same time they really love him the most. And so, yeah, but speaking of Dick Grayson, speaking of this particular series, before we get too much into it, Chad, there's a lot that happens in these six issues that is wildly different from a lot of other Batman mythology. Like somebody that's coming into this might be like, what do you mean? Like Dick Grayson got a lot of money. Didn't he have a lot of money because he's Bruce Wayne's ward? Some things that are important to note just in the context of the bat universe. First and foremost, Batman had recently lost his fortune to the Joker. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, That's one thing that's worth noting. Thing number two in the Tom King Batman run, Alfred was killed by Bane. who sneaks into the Batcave there. And then thing number three also, I believe, is part of the Tom King run. Uh, Nightwing had been shot in the head, forgot who he was, and became Rick Grayson, uh, straight (laughs) tough. Oh, wow. Was it better than it sounds? Because it doesn't sound good. (laughs) No, I I, honestly, I didn't read it, so I can't give it fair shakes. But uh, I, I also thought it sounded pretty dumb. But so that's something that's important to lay the groundwork, though, before this series started. That's the stuff that had come before. Yeah. And then Tom Taylor steps on as this fresh reboot that's starting with issue 78. And, and here we are. So, yeah, again, lots of stuff happens in this book that's a little bit different than the Batman continuity. I'm glad that Chad gave us a little 411 before we start our initial review. And we're going to go ahead and start off 
with uh, J.A. Because, again, he's been a longtime fan of Batman, but I don't know if he's read a Batman series proper in continuity. And this was his ask. Like, he asked Chad, hey, I want to read Batman in continuity. Tell me what to read. So what did you think? It went too fast. Maybe this is just modern comics. That a comic book lasts like 20 pages, and it's not enough time to tell a whole story. I thought that at the end of the five, six issues that we had read, I was like, well, nothing got resolved. Well, maybe you need to – that's how they keep you coming back, buy more issues. I don't know. I thought the whole – Heartless man? What, the, what was the guy's name? Just Heartless, no man. <laughs> oh, okay. Whatever. He was only in there for like two issues, and then he's gone. It wasn't resolved. Maybe we had to read more. I, uh, I could have used 12 issues. Every issue felt like half an issue. And I'm not even getting into the issue 87, which was all one panel pages, which literally, that's not an issue. <laughs> Okay, the artist had to work hard. The writer had to – he put like a post-it note together for that issue. <laughs> hey, now. Hey, now. Uh, to your point, I've been reading this book since it started and up to the point of this recording issue, 95 had come out. They still have yet to reveal who Heartless actually is. Uh, I think but we all know it's the guy from that first issue, first couple pages that gets uh, into the fight with little little Dick Grayson and Babs. Oh, uh, okay. They're doing a, a hush – it's like some guy from Dick Grayson's past that like, oh, remember this guy? No, no, we don't. We don't. No. We don't understand. Why did he have a gun that like cauterized wounds with like, I don't know, a cylinder? That didn't make it. It's just like to, to capture the heart. But why is he doing that? Why does he want people's hearts? Because his dad was an insurance agent. <laughs> and we all know an insurance is a scam for heartless bastards. <laughs> That's, That's so stupid. It's probably true. <laughs> it's so <laughs> stupid. But you've been reading this since the beginning, Chad. And, and is it something we're missing? Like, does this continue, like, with a lot of these storylines for a while? I honestly feel like you can get a great sense of what this series is about just from this first trade. There's just more of it. The story keeps going. There's mm. more about uh, Dick Grayson's, which, spoiler alert, his sister uh, becomes the mayor of Gotham. Yeah. And she ends up kind of working as a, a double agent of sorts and reporting back to Dick Grayson. But then they do a couple of team ups with Flash and a team Titans. There's a team up with Superboy, which is a title that Tom Taylor also writes. Ultimately, at the, at the heart of this series, uh, it's a very hopeful series. You know, it's all about Dick Grayson helping the people he can because he can. And it's just that through line. And that through line carries through uh, even the Batman Fear State crossover, which is interspersed in between there since then. You know, it's all about you know, where do you feel home is, that kind of stuff. And, and, and the dog, Haley, or Bitewing. Oh, yes. Wonderful. It's just, it's it's great writing. I loved it. I just struggling against the medium more than anything else. Like modern comics. I just thought it wasn't, I needed more. I was like, give me more story, you know? Everything just felt like it hadn't been developed enough. Well, one of the things I wanted to comment on is like is sometimes we talk about retcons on this particular show and how there are good retcons, there's bad retcons. There is a pretty huge retcon in this. And again, spoiler alert for those people that haven't read it. You, you do find out that uh, Dick Grayson has a sister. And not only does he have a sister, but she's related to the Zukos, who you might know even from... Batman the Animated Series, which is a great episode, two-part episode called Robin's Reckoning. Again, is Robin's origin. You know that the Zukos are the ones that killed the Flying Graysons, his parents, and then originally then put Dick with, with Bruce Wayne, and they, be, they began their historic partnership. But you find out in this series that the Zukos killing uh, the Flying Graysons was um, not random or even involved with some sort of crime or something. It was basically because Tony Zuko was pissed off at Robin's dad for, you know, having relations with some girl that he liked or his wife. At his the time. wife. <laughs> yeah. No, it was his, it was his mail order bride that yeah. was human trafficked against her will to Zuko. And then she escaped to the circus and, the Graysons sheltered her, and as payback for sheltering her, 
He killed them. I think he only found out that the daughter was born after the fact, and yeah. then he hid it because it was embarrassed. So right. they weren't killed because Dick Grayson's dad fathered a child. They were killed because the Graysons sheltered this woman. And just to stick up for Dick Grayson's dad, it was before he was married. Uh, his relationship with his, uh, you know, Robin's eventual or Dick Grayson's eventual mom was in an in-between phase. So there was there wasn't cheating going on. Okay. And also he wasn't a deadbeat dad. He didn't know that ah. he had impregnated this woman because she had been kidnapped by Zuko again. Right. So there's but, a lot of intrigue. Yes, there is. But I think to my point is sometimes when these kind of retcons happen, longtime comic book fans kind of have a reaction to it. Like, again. Some retcons are great, like, you know, uh, bringing back Bucky as the Winter Soldier. That worked out really well. I'm still kind of like, why did they bring back Jason Todd? Like, even with the Red Hood and everything, I still thought that was kind of like, ah, that was reactionary. Like, it was because they brought back Bucky and they were like, ah, we'll bring back Jason Todd too, whatever. So I, I guess that's my question to you guys is like, there, there's a pretty big retcon and it deals with somebody's origin. For me, in some ways, this was the same thing as finding out that like, hey, uh, Jack Napier, I don't know, killed Bruce Wayne's parents in, in Batman 89. I was just like, no, I don't No, Joker didn't kill his parents. No, that's that's dumb. So I wanted to ask, like, did you think this was good, bad, indifferent? It's a retcon. So comic book fans have feelings yeah, about it. But in terms of retcons, I think it's like a minor retcon. OK, the fact that he has a sister, maybe that's the retcon. But I mean. How much do we care about Dick Grayson's parents? The only point that Dick Grayson's parents provided previous to this story was that they died. And therefore, it could not be his parents. And so he had to go live with Batman. They still die. He still has to go live with Batman. It didn't change his story much. You just added this thing that he had a, a long lost sister. We have long lost relatives in comics all the time. I think anyone who gets their... Nickers in a twist over this is, I. Yeah, I'm with Jay on this one. I don't think this is Nicker twistable. That sounds terrible. Uh, no, this sounds is, like a purple nurple. Yeah, but no, this is just a storytelling device. And is it something that's going to go down in the annals of Batman history or Nightwing history? Maybe, maybe not. But for the time being, it's telling a really fun story, and it's you know giving that extra boost, that extra emotional connection. And it has still yet to play out. So we'll see how, see where it goes. Yeah. You know, sometimes these things are, are forgotten just as quickly as they're brought in. Sometimes, you know, they make that lasting impression. I think the jury's right. still out. Well, the other big retcon or quote unquote thing that's changed in this continuity, and you brought it up during your recap, is the fact that Alfred's dead. Like Alfred being dead in this particular series actually is, for me, even more of an emotional weight than finding out that Dick Grayson had a sister. Like, because I think, like, this first whole trade is about dealing with the passing of somebody that Dick really looked to as a father figure, even more than Bruce. Like, yeah, Bruce is his dad, but Bruce is like, yeah, he never calls me. Yeah, he always texts me. Like, I'm never good enough for him. Like, he's like that dad that keeps pushing you, that you're like, oh, I got to begrudging respect for but like eh. but alfred is just really there he's the one that's putting band-aids on knees and things like that and so for that person the real caregiver to be gone uh and some of the scenes you know where he's reading this letter that alfred wrote to him where like, alfred was always proud of him and the man that he became again it was really heartfelt for me and to chad's point about like hitting some emotional notes i think tom taylor does that in this series uh but i guess that's my second question is like how did you take like alfred just being gone and like that effect on the story chad well i think storytelling wise it, it all goes back to that theme of you know home is where you're the most comfortable and in here they you know there are people that are dealing with homelessness and then you have dick grayson and his relationship with babs uh all these things are, are about finding that home and so I, I think it definitely plays in and emotionally, oh my goodness, the stuff about Alfred calling him his son and like, and, and sure you have Bruce as the rough around the edges father, but also Alfred is the nurturer. You know, how wonderful are those scenes with Alfred? It's just, 
you know, it's great. At the same time, I think naming his society the Alfred Pennyworth Charity is the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> because Alfred was not the type of person to seek the limelight or get one recognition or draw attention to the fact that, you know, the house where he lived for generations has a giant cave underneath with a big penny and a dinosaur. <laughs> and you're just asking for trouble. But no, I, I think as far as emotionally, you know, it, it all fits into the themes of Tom Taylor's story here. And if there's one thing I could say about Tom Taylor as a writer, and this is true in his deceased work, this is true in his injustice work, uh, he gets the characters in the DC universe so well. And the connections between those characters, it's just further on display here. He's just masterful with that stuff. And so I guess my, my last question before we get to break is the art in this particular book is, is really great. But I think we all wanted to talk about a particular set of panels in this book that we had strong feelings about. J.A., why don't you set us up? Issue 87, which was Eisner nominated, is essentially one continuous long unending panel. I mean, you, you turn the page, and then this double page spreads, double page spreads, but they all would connect to each other. If you could cut it out and stretch it out, it'd be one long panel. Tells the story you see, like, you know, across the panels, across the page, little Nightwing jumping, flying, leaping, crawling. It, it's exciting. It's, 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 it's a nice artistic gimmick, and it gave Tom Taylor a day off, because literally he did not have to write anything. Oh, J.A., you're breaking my heart here. I'm sure Tom Taylor, in addition to Bruno Redondo, had to work together to lay something like this out, which has the repeated, you know, Nightwing running across the, the page, basically throughout the entire book. It's called Get Grayson, and it's Nightwing on the run, and eventually Batgirl comes in, and he's fighting all these characters. Like, the craft that goes into setting something like this up, you're breaking my heart by underselling, you know, Tom Taylor's writing here, because while it is a Bruno Redondo accomplishment, the writing has to go a long way to set that stuff up. And did you catch the Scooby-Doo mystery machine in there? Yes, I did, actually. That was awesome. There's also a great scene where Babs is, is uh, wearing the T-shirt that has Batman slapping Robin. <laughs> these little notes i love it i'm not saying it's not a great accomplishment and it you know the art is great it almost makes up for in issue 79 the utter travesty that is babs and dick eating pizza (laughs) (laughs) who eats pizza like that the pizza's stiff so i guess if it was made out of just cardboard you could hold it like that Mm. i don't know there's even one of the panels where babs's hand is like in a really weird contorted way where the pizza's like sitting on top of it or the on top of the hand. I was just like, yeah. that's not how pizza works. Check our social media pages on uh, Atlas Comic Shop on Twitter and Instagram. We will post the pictures here of this renowned series, you know, that was critically acclaimed that does not understand how pizza works. <laughs> and I, I feel terrible because they also don't understand how bagels work and they show that in later issues along the way. <laughs> But there's so many other little minor fun things about this series. Yeah. Gorgeous stuff. Still doesn't know how pizza works, but (laughs) gorgeous work. Bruno Redondo. So, but we'll be back with our final rating of the Nightwing series right after these commercial breaks. So stay tuned. Welcome to Making Nerds Cringe with Matt and Thad. And we're a podcast that retells comics' greatest stories. Poorly? Yeah, not too good. Well, we're out to have fun. That's true. It's full of uh, adult material. That's right. Shenanigans. That is correct, man. Inappropriate humor. You betcha. And a whole lot of other stuff that we're struggling to not say because it'll be bleeped out. That's right. Hey, give us a quick example. Well, for one, Galactus gets in an argument with a cashier. Oh, yeah, I remember Dr. That Doom episode. becomes a pimp. Oh, the Juggalos appear in a couple of episodes. That's right. They keep popping up. Why? Tune in to find out. That's right. And don't be rude to people who make your food. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. And, well, it's under Making Nerds Cringe, every single one of them. So please, give us a follow, or we will follow you home and notify yourself when we release things. Because that's what a good person would do. 
back with more of The Last Comic Shop, and it is now time for our ratings, where if you like Batman books, make sure that you continue to listen to The Last Comic Shop, because we cover them here. If you like Superman books, too, yeah, we cover them here. If you like Green Lantern books, go somewhere else. <laughs> We're not covering them on the show. Not yet, at least. People still haven't left us comments to say what Green Lantern series is we should read. If you guys want us to read this other DC stuff, leave us comments. Go to at Last Comic Shop on Twitter. Leave us comments. We'll read these books if you tell us what you want us to read. Any case, on this week's show, we read Nightwing. Jay's got a one out of four scale for us in our rating. What's our one out of four scale? Oh, this one's easy. One out of four slices of pizza eaten properly. <laughs> What's your favorite kind of pizza, J.A.? Is it is it deep dish? Is it New York style? Well, deep dish isn't pizza, so yeah, New York style pizza. <laughs> oh, oh, and the gauntlet has been thrown. Deep dish is a pie made like a pizza ingredients. That's why they call it a pizza pie. <laughs> I, no, I, I agree. New York is is the best of the pizzas, but I don't discount the deep dish. You can have. A giant, super thick pizza cake, whatever it is. That's still a pizza. Right. I, I do enjoy uh, pineapple on my pizza. A lot of people get after me about that, but I, I do. Pineapple bacon pizza or a pineapple ham pizza, that's delicious. I love all the pizzas, but my favorite is the super thin New York style pizza that comes out piping hot. Where if, when you pick it up, if you're not careful, the cheese will just slide right off. <laughs> Pizza. That's why you fold it in half. That's right. Fold it in half to keep keep all the grease together. It's like a taco, which is not a sandwich, evidently. But a, but a hero is. Anyways, we're getting off topic. Even though it's a Greek taco. All right. And, and let's go with you, J.A. How many how many pizza slices are you giving it? Yeah, it was a fun book. Um, it wasn't long enough. And maybe that's just we didn't read enough. And modern comics, 22 pages. You can't really tell a story. So those things kind of hampered it because I felt like at the end, while I was satisfied that he had, you know, announced his grand new plan, nothing else had been even remotely resolved at all. And if I was reading this in the nineties, this all would have been compacted into a single issue. So that being said, I I, I give it like three, I give it three pizza slices. Yeah. I failed to mention that I love the colors uh adriana lucas did the colors on this and just i think married so well with bruno redondo's art even that issue that literally was written on a post-it note spectacular <laughs> looking all right uh chad this was your pick for this week what are you giving it buddy oh yeah i love this stuff and no i i can definitely see ja's point that this is that decompressed storytelling that you know seemed like it kicked off at the beginning of the 2000s where, you know, what would be one or two issues is now stretched out to six or eight or 12 or whatever. But the art is fantastic. And Bruno Redondo uh, relies heavily on the Zipatone. So you get those little dots all the time. Yeah. Uh, Bruno Redondo really is a wonderful storyteller. He has the chops. And that issue 87 that Jay likes to rag on. Like, it, it really is masterful stuff. And it's one of those things where it wouldn't fit with every character, but it fits with Nightwing. Like, he is the heart and soul of the DC universe. Do I think some things are kind of corny, like the heartless villain? Sure. Uh, Is there atrocious pizza eating, bagel eating scenes? Sure. There there are flaws here. But right now, this was just what I needed, and it's something that's uplifting. And I'll I'll be honest, uh, the world in general is really tough right now. And there are a few things I needed more than just a hopeful story. I always talk about how DC books traditionally are much better for the trades and Marvel books are better for the long boxes. This is, uh, you know, as Marvel of a book, you know, as I've seen come out of DC in a long time, where each issue keeps me coming back. And I'm happy to stack up issue after issue uh, as long as it keeps coming at the same quality. So at the end of the day, I'm going to go 3.75. As long as Tom Taylor and Bruno Redondo are making this book, I'm buying this book. Okay, Chad, you convinced me. Slice off another half of a pizza slice for me. I'll, I'm gonna up mine to three and a half. You just convinced oh, wow. me. Look at you. To look eat at some you. more. Oh, feeling generous with our pizzas today. I mean, I, I'm I'm gonna agree with that. I think it's a three and a half. 
uh, pizza slices here. Uh, so maybe three three slices and maybe one of my favorite kind of pizzas, the ones that come in the little squares. I love square pizza. I don't know why I like square pizza. I just do. It's like New York style, but it's like square. So it's like, it seems like bite size. I You're love a monster. it. monster. A monster. <laughs> <laughs> it has no crust. That's why I'm not a crust guy. I never have been. I'm a, I'm a sauce toppings, uh, cheese dude. I am not a bread dude. I do not like the carbs, my friend. Is that the Detroit style or is that different? I don't know what Detroit style is actually, other than maybe they have lead in their water. I. <laughs> Oh. In, in, in the Philippines, Andrew, you are talking about the party cut. Because it is a party. That's what this book is. And I know that Chad likes to say, you know, DC books are for trades and Marvel books are for long boxes. And I can agree with that because this is kind of like a long box series. I'm going to take that one step further and say this Nightwing series is going to be great for an omnibus because that's what you're going to have to kind of need in order to get a, a, a full story. It's probably like 25 issues. Of this series. I think it's going to be a great arc over the next 25 issues because Tom Taylor does have that ability to keep you coming back for more. Uh, it, nothing underscores that more than just the relationship between Dick Grayson and Barbara Gordon in this, because even though you know that these two characters have done the nasty in the past, they have been a couple in the past, somehow Tom Taylor still gets you to believe this is Sam and Diane. Where it's like, when are they going to do it? When are they going to get together? Sam and Diane, for all our younger listeners, is uh, <laughs> two characters in a 1980s sitcom called Cheers. Which is on Netflix. Turn on your Netflix, kids. Learn some stuff. If people don't know what Cheers is in this day and age, I, I, I give up. I give up on America. That's That's all I'm saying about that. It keeps coming you back for more, whether or not it's like the the mystery around who this heartless person is, which, I, 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 yeah, I mean, it's to Chad's point, it's probably the guy at the beginning that, you know, Dick broke his nose and he was heartless because he was insurance, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, the real bad guy in this is Blockbuster. I mean, the Triple H dude. Like, he's the guy that runs Blue Haven, and he is a good bad guy. He makes you want to believe that, like, hey... Uh, Nightwing has some massive foe to overcome in the end. And they bring on other parts of the Batman universe. Again, another wonderful thing about Tom Taylor's writing is that he brings in like a lot of whispers and hints of Dick's past. That when Dick is potentially being kidnapped, the entire Teen Titans is on their way, plus Batman, to rescue him. Uh, Every hero in the DC universe is going to stick up for this guy. It's because it's Robin. You know, there was a reason why when they killed Jason Todd, everybody was up in arms about them killing Jason Todd. It's because everyone thought they killed Robin, meaning Dick Grayson. Everyone loves Dick Grayson. I don't care who you are. I don't even care if you're a Batman fan. You love Robin. Robin is us. Robin is that person that we we try to be. He's the heart of the DC universe. He's the guy that talks to Batman and Superman, and they both think of him as their kid. And so, like, he's the kid in all of us. And so this is a great series about one of the best characters in DC Comics, which is Dick Grayson. To zoom the camera out a little bit, too, to understand where this series is happening in the, the timeline of DC history Dan Didio, who was the boss at DC for a, a good long time, always hated Dick Grayson and was always trying to kill him off in their various crossovers and their varying events. And for one reason after another, it never actually happened. But uh, after all those years of mucking with the character and trying to, to take him off the board because Dick Grayson makes Batman and his place in the overall timeline awkward. Like, how can Batman have so many Robins? So they've always wanted to shuffle him off the board until Dan Didio himself was shuffled off the board. And then you get this series that is nothing but a celebration of Dick Grayson as the heart of the DC universe. In any case, uh, some other books that you should pick up at your local comic book shop are our recommendations. Yes, every single week on The Last Comic Shop, we'd like to give you other books that you can check out in addition to this wonderful trade of Nightwing, and maybe you can still find issue 87 before it becomes one of those books that's really hard to find, because, again, it was an Eisner Award-nominated book, so it's probably 
I don't know if it's a key, but it's... I don't know if it's a key, but I have three copies, one to keep as a reader and two to cut up so I can sit out that one giant piano. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what you should do with your comic books, kids. Uh, surely they've released that as a poster. Oh, if they had. That's the way to go. In any case, some other ways to go is these recommendations. We're going to start off with Chad's pick this week. So, Chad, give us another great book that we should pick up at our local comic book shops. Okay, so I've gushed about Tom Taylor a lot, and I'm going to keep that going. Uh, So the book I'm going to recommend, it comes out of Boom Studios for 18 issues. It's written, obviously, by Tom Taylor, with art by Danielle de Nicolo. All apologies if I messed that up. But uh, there are seven powerful secrets in this world, and there are ancient orders, and really it's one of those youth coming of age and finding your place stories amidst all this intrigue. And it has beautiful art, it has relatable characters, it has tons of great action. Uh, I could see it being the next big uh, movie franchise where it's a cross between those YA stories like a Hunger Games and uh, superhero action adventure and secret societies. It has all that stuff and more. So check it out at Seven Secrets out of Boom Studios. All right. Well, I'll go up next. And speaking of wonderful crime noir street level characters, there is no better street level character. Well, I guess some people would say Batman is the best street level character. Other people would say it's Daredevil. But no, no, no. I'm here to say if you're a new comic book fan, if you're an old comic book fan, you should never sleep on the spirit. That's right. Uh, Created by the guy that the Eisner Award is named after, Will Eisner, a titan of the industry the spirit has been around since june 2nd of 1940 when he first appeared as a feature in a 16 page tabloid style newsprint comic insert distributed in the sunday edition of the register and tribune syndicate newspapers and it continued well into the 1950s uh, until 1952 and if you are one of those comic book fans that have never read the spirit there is a wonderful book that you can find at most comic book shops uh in trade paperback called the best of the spirit it's put out by dc comics uh and as the cover kind of says it is the citizen kane of comics according to usa today but this is a real wonderful collection of what makes the spirit one of the best comics because you think that the spirit is kind of like all those other you know pulpy uh, 1930s, 1940s superheroes in that, you know, he runs around fighting crime and stuff like that. But really, the spirit is an exercise in Will Eisner really expanding what you could use comic books to do in types of stories that you could tell with comic books. In fact, there are some stories of the spirit that actually don't even involve the spirit. One of my absolute favorites uh, that's in this collection is a story called The Story of Harold Schnobel. And it's basically a story about this loser named Harold who, when he was a kid, learned that he could he could fly. But his, his dad was like, nah, you're going to be looked at as a freak, so I don't want you to tell anybody. So he went through his entire life just kind of being a loser, even though he had this really special power. And one day he's just had enough. And he decides he's going to show his power to the entire world. And at the same time, the spirit is trying to stop a bunch of gangsters on top of a rooftop somewhere. So he's going to do his his big leap of faith to show the entire world that he is a special person, that he can fly. And so he jumps off the building, and within a couple of panels, he's accidentally shot by one of the gangsters trying to shoot the spirit. Falls to earth, and nobody sees him fly. That kind of storytelling was unheard of at the time and so if you've never read these original issues of the spirit you got to pick up the best of the spirit by will eisner it will open your eyes jay what do you have for us i have something that i can't believe hasn't been made into a movie yet it reminded me a lot of what we're reading in nightwing in that it was fun it is the Savage Dragon, Baptism of Fire. This is the trade paperback that collects the original first four issues, the miniseries that launched the dragon on the world. Eric Larson's great invention from Image Comics. He wakes up 
He doesn't know who he is or why he's green or why he has a giant fin, why he can survive fire. He's obviously skipped leg day his entire life, but he's got a massive upper body. And he becomes a cop in, in Chicago because Chicago is overrun with super freaks and crime lords. And it's just bonkers crazy. There's this great scene where he's got to enter this house where the bad guys are. And so he jumps up like 50 feet into the air and then comes down like Superman with two submachine guns shooting at the roof to make a hole for him to fly through. Oh, I, I remember being a kid and having issue one of Savage Dragon and trying to recreate that in all the comic books I was drawing. Like, just the way he enters that house, through the ceiling, he's smashing floorboards, he's got two guns over his head. I thought it was the most badass thing I had ever seen. And it was like at the height of Eric Larson, because I had just read all that Spider-Man stuff, and I love Eric Larson even more than Todd McFarlane on Spider-Man. So, like, you're speaking my language, buddy. That is a great pick. Nobody wore a white singlet better than the Savage Dragon. <laughs> the original Savage Dragon mini I thought was three issues. But I'm looking, the Baptism of Fire has the image zero, which is the one you had to cut out the coupons and mail in. Yes, yes, so you get everything. And if you're a Comixology Unlimited subscriber, you can download it for free. Well, there you go. So even better, free Savage Dragon. Yes. That's what you want in life. And what else do you want in life is more episodes of The Last Comic Shop, and you can get them every single week by going out to our website, www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com, finding any of the list of major podcasting platforms that we are on, clicking on one of those, subscribing, and if you're nice enough, rating and reviewing as well. We're also on YouTube, so you can find all of our episodes there, as well as awesome videos, interviews with great comic book artists, folks that we're supporting on Kickstarters, unboxing of action figures, all kinds of stuff. All that wonderful stuff out on our website. And you can use that website to track down our social media accounts. We are at Last Comic Shop on Twitter and Instagram, where you can find things like JA's weekly polls. You can find things like Golden Age covers to tuck you in at night. You can find what we're picking up at comic shops. You can find things we're discussing or fun little memes we like to post or whatever we're doing on the social medias that day. But if you need help finding those, once again, you can always go back to the home base, www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com, where they can find what else? Well, we've got links to our merch store. You can get singlets. We do sell singlets. Um, or or uh, what, what do they call them? A-shirts? I think they're A-shirts, yeah. And trench coats? No. No trench coats. Mm. No, not None yet. That. Can't get pizza either. We tried to branch out into Last Comic Shop Pizza. It was just making all the boxes greasy. So, like, it was really hard to ship. But it, we do we do have um, coffee mugs and tote bags, so, you know. Yeah, you can put your pizza in a coffee mug. There you go. Based on the way that you, people eat pizza in this comic book, it, it makes just as much sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's the pizza in a cup scene from The Jerk. Oh, lordy. While we may be the last comic shop podcast, we don't actually want to be the last comic shop. And so we encourage everybody to go out to the shops near you. If you need to find them, you can always use the Comic Shop Locator, www.comicshoplocator.com, where you could seek out things we talked about this week, like Nightwing by Tom Taylor and uh, Bruno Redondo, or you could look for Seven Secrets by Tom Taylor, or you could find The Best of the Spear by Will Eisner, or The Savage Dragon Baptism of Fire by Eric Larson. All that and more waits for you at your local comic shop. All right. And until next week, I was the host with the most, Andy Larson. I was joined by Chad Smith and Jay Scott. And we hope you come back to the last comic shop. Till then, stay safe, stay tuned, and remember... Will Tom Taylor's tumultuously timed tales turn out to be terrific? Tune in next week. Same last comic shop. Time, same last comic shop channel.
next comic shop was a 2022 Black Angus production.